Philippians chapter 1, verse 13. And we're going to continue the sermon series I've been preaching. This is the third week now, titled Joy to the World. Joy to the World. What I've tried to do in this series is to see what the Bible has to say about the subject of joy. Around this time of the year, we sing the song, Joy to the World. You look at plaques and banners, and you see the word joy. But yet it seems like that as believers, that's the last thing that we're enjoying. And so in our first sermon, I titled it, It Can Be a Reality. And I talked about Luke chapter 2 and the declaration that the angels made when they were introducing Jesus. And I think that it's very important for us to understand that if the angels in their introduction of Jesus said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, then we ought to receive from that. Amen. If that was the message with the introduction of Jesus. Last week, we got into sermon two and we talked about the how. We got into the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 15, when Jesus said, I want my joy to remain in you and I want that joy to be full. And so we talked about how to make joy a reality. Well, today I want to talk about keeping the joy. So we've talked about the angelic declaration. We talked about the how and how to make it a reality. Who wants to hear about how to keep it today? Amen. Amen. Oh, I can't wait. Philippians chapter one, verses 12 through 18. And let's, let's go through this and read all these verses and we'll pray and we'll jump into this. The apostle Paul here, and I touched on this a little bit last week, writing from the Philippian jail, the whole book of Philippians, he's writing as he's being held for preaching the gospel. He writes these words in verse 12. I want you to understand, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. It's a pretty optimistic point of view about being in prison, isn't it? Verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all the other places. And so the apostle Paul is saying, you know what? There's a greater goal for what I'm going through, and that's what brings me joy. That even though I don't see the manifestation now, I know that in the future and in future generations, and here we are in 2018, 2,000 years almost since this was written, we're now still seeing the fruit of what the Apostle Paul's talking about. He says, I'm in prison for a reason, and that's why I can keep my joy, because I'm looking beyond and I'm looking past The book of Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, Jesus was able to endure the shame and he was able to endure the cross because he looked past the cross. And so this is how we're able to keep joy. This is how we can maintain it. This is how we can live is we got to have the right perspective about our circumstances. And now the apostle Paul comes in and says, all that I'm going through now is being seen by everybody in the palace. Basically what he's saying is is the, the jail keeper And everybody that's in the palace and and the leaders, and they're all watching me. I'm on display, and they're seeing my attitude, and they're seeing how I'm handling being in prison, and the Lord's going to use this as a testimony to win people for the kingdom. Are you seeing this? Verse 14. Many of the brethren in the Lord are waxing confident in my bonds. And now he takes it over to those that he's discipling, those pastors that he's raising up, those churches that he started and he's he's saying even they're being confident they're seeing my attitude while i'm going through this and it's now causing them to be confident that it'll be worth it amen isn't this awesome and they're now bold to speak the word of god without fear verse 14 15 some indeed preach christ out of envy and some out of strife and some also of goodwill verse 16 the one preaches christ out of contention not out of sincerity, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. Verse 17 and 18, and we'll close this. But the other out of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, before I read 18, the the Apostle Paul comes to this conclusion. There's even people out there preaching the gospel, and they're not doing it for the right reasons. So he's talking about everything he's going through. And you can see his attitude. It's okay. People in the palace are watching me. It's okay. The disciples I'm raising up, they're watching me. It's okay. The churches that I have started and the pastors that I've appointed, they're all watching me. And this is what he says in verse 18. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, it's okay. Christ is preached. And I do what? 
Rejoice comes from the word joy. We learned that in the first message. Rejoice is a refreshing of joy. And the Bible says he's got to continually keep maintaining that joy. And so the Apostle Paul's giving testimony. I still got joy. And I will continue to rejoice. Father, I pray that you anoint this word today. I pray that you uh, just guide me and lead me. Anoint my heart, Lord. And Father, I pray that you open ears to hear and hearts to accept and receive. And I pray that this message is going to inspire some people. It's going to really strengthen faith today. And Lord, I want your will to be done in Jesus' name. I say it, amen. A couple of things I want to accomplish in this message today, and one of those is to let you know that the healing power of laughter is real, and it's even backed by science. And the Bible, before science even discovered this, tells us so. And we're going to talk about that today. It's okay to laugh. Now, don't laugh at someone else's expense. But it's good to laugh, and sometimes we just need to laugh. How many of you realize that you need, just need a good laugh sometimes? Amen? I, I, I laugh at myself. Sometimes I laugh the hardest at myself. And we need to. There's healing power in laughter. But there's also restoration and strength that comes with joy. Proverbs 17, says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. The King James says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. This scriptural truth suggests that laughter holds as much healing power as medication. Somebody tell the pharmaceutical companies this. And the Bible declares it this thousands of years before medical science finally understood this. When we laugh, when you do research, when you laugh, powerful endorphins, which act a lot like morphine, are released to the brain, and it triggers a feeling of well-being throughout the entire body. So you see, a merry heart does work good, like medicine. Research supports this fact that if a person is happy and they're at peace with themselves and their surroundings, they have fewer illnesses. And they don't struggle with depression. In the Department of Behavioral Medicine of the UCLA Medical School, Norman Cousins conducted extensive research into the physical benefits of happiness, and he established the Humor Research Task Force that coordinated worldwide clinical research on the subject of humor. Cousins' body of research proved conclusively that laughter, happiness, and joy are perfect antidotes for stress and depression and any kind of emotional sickness. But the Lord said in Isaiah 26, 3, long before that discovery was made, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Nehemiah 8, 10 told us thousands of years before this discovery that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so this leads us to our first lesson today, and it's this, joy is an inside job. If in God's presence is fullness of joy and he's the source of our joy and salvation accompanies or joy accompanies salvation, I taught that in the first lesson, then we understand that the origins of our joy have to come from within and not from without. The Apostle Paul confirms this in Philippians chapter 1. Joy is an inside job. And here's the thought. The depth of our joy will be determined by the perspective that we have about our problems. Let me say that again. The depth of our joy will be determined by the perspective that we have about our problems. As we read Philippians chapter 1, we realize that the Apostle Paul was going through a lot of different levels of stress. He was going through persecution. He was in jail for his faith. People were actually coming against him. People in the church were actually coming against him. But it was his perspective on those problems that allowed him to maintain his joy. Can I get an amen? I think most of us know that there's no way we can live in a world without troubles or trials or tribulation, without disasters, without diseases, without difficulties. I think we understand that. And I will admit that life would be a whole lot less stressful if we didn't have those issues going on in our life, but we can't predict when they come. Jesus said, when the storm comes, not if the storm comes. So we got to go a little bit deeper and we've got to find out where is the source of my joy coming from? How can I get to this place that in the midst of these circumstances, I can still maintain the joy of the Lord? It's understanding that joy is an inside job. 
Here in Philippians, Paul introduces us to a joy that runs deeper than any problems that any of us can ever experience. A joy that's greater than anything that we can ever imagine. Hear me. Let me repeat it. The depth of our joy is determined by the perspective that we have about our problems. It's all about perspective. Let's look at verse 12 once again. I want you to understand, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, if you're taking notes, write down the word furtherance. If, if, if you've got a Bible and you haven't underlined it, I want you to underline the word furtherance because in order for us to gain a greater understanding of what the Apostle Paul is talking about, we've got to go back to the original Greek definition of what this means, and it's a whole lot deeper than what some of us realize. This word is crucial to having a proper perspective on our problems. The word furtherance, when you look it up, in the Greek, it is a military term. And it refers to woodcutters that go before the army and clears the path, opening the way for the army to go into battle. So I want you to hear me. The apostle Paul understood that what he was doing was clearing the way for future generations. It was his perspective about his problems that gave him the joy to keep moving forward. Anybody in here ever been busy about kingdom work and you wonder if you're making a difference in anybody's life? Anybody in here that, that, that does church ministry and many of you are faithful week in, week out, month in, month out. Some of you have been here for years. Some of you have been here longer than I've been here. And I've been here almost 18 years in April. And I bet some of you, Dave, I bet there's been times you've questioned all the years that you've put into this church. Jake, how many times have you questioned everything that's happened here in this church? Jerry, how many times have you questioned and you look and you think, man, I've put all these years into ministry. I've poured into people's life. I've sowed the seed. But God, you said you'd water it and bring the increase. But where's the increase? Sheila, how many times did you week in and week out and week in teach those kids in that Sunday school class? And you wonder, is anybody even listening to me? Am I making a difference in anybody's life? Listen, I'm here to tell you that because joy is an inside job, if you can have the proper perspective, understand that God is using you like the word furtherance to plow the way for future generations. The word of God will not return back to him void. God will accomplish what it is he's setting out to do through you. Every word you speak, every prayer you pray, every time you get bruised knuckles and, and every time you put your blood and your sweat and your tears into the work of the kingdom, listen to me it is for the furtherance of what it is that God is trying to accomplish through you and into the future even if you don't see the harvest even if you don't see the results of your labor God is working Amen. Susan I want to put this up on the screen I came across this this week and when I was working on this message I sat I said this I couldn't even Sheila had no idea that what she did for Sunday school was going to impact me as much this morning. She didn't know what I was preaching. She didn't know the kind of week I've had. This is from Grace. Dear Bishop Sanders, I like how you're our pastor. And I love how you're the one that teaches us about God in the Bible. God loves you. God is in your heart all the time, everywhere. Love grace. And so when I wonder if I'm making a difference in anybody's life, Sheila hands me a stack of handwritten cards from our children. And Sunday school will let me know that even our kids are watching. In 1996, in the spring of 1996, I was going through a tough time. I had just finished two years of pastoring. I got into pastoring at the age of 24 in 1994, full of arrogance and pride and just had a lot of issues. And so my first pastorate was the, out of 92 Church of Gods in the state, it was number 92. I was 24, and the overseer looked at me and thought, I'm going to reward you with a church that we just shut down 
a few days before. We want to keep the doors open, so we're going to send you down to your hometown where a prophet's not received in his hometown. You're going to go back down to Pele. And so I served two years there. I told the overseer that it wouldn't be permanent, but I would go down to gain some experience and at least keep the doors open. And I drove an hour and a half one way to pastor that church. And I knew it was time to leave. And we were running. I mean, we were running. That We had two people when I first started the church. And they were on vacation. <laughs> they were retired. And I took the church in the spring. And they were in California, retired. And uh, they're with the Lord right now. Great people. I love them. The Warrens, they were great, great people. And... Um, so when I left, the church was probably running about 50, which for Paoli was, is, was decent and, you know, being 24 and driving an hour and a half one day. And I knew my work was over. And I went with the overseer and I said, I, my work is done. I just, I, I can't understand this. I don't like, and he said, it's okay. And so this little church in Austin, Indiana opened up. I was talking to the overseer and I said, what's available? And he said, well, I'm glad you asked because about 15 minutes south of where you're living, there's this little church called the Austin Community Church of God, and it is on Man Avenue and is in a horrible part of the city. It's a city of about 2,000 people, and we shut the doors of this church a while back, and we've sent a retired pastor down, and he's going down on Friday. He's living in the church in one of the Sunday school rooms, and he's preaching on Sundays, and, uh, and when he finishes the service, he, he drives back home during the week, and, uh, but he's getting older, and He's with the Lord right now, too, and, and he said, it's just, it's barely hanging on, running about 10, 12 people, which was a, better than two people from a couple of years earlier, and uh, it was April of 96, and so I said, eh, it's only 15, 20 minutes from where I'm living, I'll take it. Of course, you know, I'm working full-time as a pastor, and um, which, when you're that young, that's just the way it's going to be. That was five of some of the toughest years of my life. And got up at 2.30 every morning, worked a full-time job, and then pastored, led worship, did everything. Maintenance man, and you name it, I was everything, and I, I was wore out. And I remember when I was pastoring that church, it was a very needy church, very high maintenance. There were times that I wondered, Lord, why am I here? Why am I here? I was there for five years, and when we left, we were running probably 100 to 120. We were filling up the sanctuary. We were on the radio, and the Lord was really blessing. A lot of lives were being won to the kingdom. That's when the overseer called and said, hey, I got a church in Terre Haute I want you to pray about. <laughs> and the Lord led me here. When I left the church, it continued to decline and, um, and I hated that. And eventually, the other church of God in the, in the city took over the building. It was no longer an official congregation. And it was tough. When I left, there were some people that had committed suicide and some people that had died from drug overdose, and it affected a lot of people, a lot of families in the church. And I remember a couple of years ago, I remember the pastor of the district church getting with me, and he said, you know what's going on over in that building that you pastored in? I said, no. I said, the last I heard about anything going on, I knew that the church had really went down to nothing. And, and I remember this building, and you can barely see the picture, and I remember this building. When I took the church, the building should have been condemned. The floor was falling through. and the right-hand side of the sanctuary, there was a gap that you can see in the wall. You can see the cinder block. It was rotting out. You couldn't walk through the right-hand side of the stage where there was uh, offices. The floor was falling through. The pews had orange carpet circa 1960 glued to the pews for padding. The carpet was circa 1960 blue carpet. Paneling inside, there were three different holes in the ceiling. The ceiling was leaking. There was actually a gym in the back and the gym was falling apart. They weren't using the gym because one of the leaks was in the gym. You go back into the fellowship hall area and the floor was falling through. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to take this church, but the Lord told me to take it and I took it anyway. 
And after a couple of years, we were blessed by the Lord. We were actually to go in that we went in there and some of the men in the church and I got together and within two weeks, we, it, we got out of church on a Sunday. We went in and gutted out that whole floor in that sanctuary and rebuilt everything. Had carpet laid, bought new seats, new walls, new sound system, fixed the roof. There was a gentleman that was attending the church that lived in Louisville. He was a businessman and he owned a roofing company and he was good friends with me. I actually did his wedding a few years earlier and he was willing to come in at cost and rebuild the roof on that church. And so the Lord began to grow and the Lord began to bless. But at one time, I didn't want to be there. And at one time, I didn't know why I was there. And when the church shut down a few years ago, I'm like, wow, why did I even go? And when this pastor said, you know what they're doing with your old building? And I said, I'm sorry, I put a lot of time into this church. They had taken over the church building and they had let the church use it for their youth and children, but they had their own gym, so they didn't really need it, but they wanted to keep the building alive. He said, there's a ministry here in the city that's reaching out to children whose parents have died because of meth overdose and HIV. And it was a national story. It was actually on the national news that a little city in, in Indiana, Austin, population of 2,000, that people were dying of HIV. There was an HIV outbreak because the drug problem there was so bad. It wasn't that bad when I was there, and it just, it was bad. You can Google it. You can look it up. You can see how bad it was. And he said, there's an addiction ministry that has taken over that church. And they're reaching out to people that are addicted to drugs, and they're reaching out to children and they're reaching out to youth, and they're doing special services, and they, they've got a bus, and they're going out, and they're feeding families. And I sit back, and I saw this this week. And I thought, 20 years ago, I wanted to quit and walk away from the challenge of having to keep that building together. It should have been condemned. And for all those years, I'm like, Lord, I put a lot of time into that church. And I'm reminded of chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 12, where the Apostle Paul said, what I'm doing is not about me. What I'm doing is I'm plowing the way for future generations to receive the seeds I'm planting. Outside the Hope to Others Church on Man Avenue in Austin, Indiana. Let's scroll down, Susan. And there's the pastor. The founder, Billy Snowden, dances with children during a weekly Thursday night youth program. Each week, the nonprofit founded by Billy and his wife, Dana, in 2010, welcomes up to 35 children. Most of these children hail from Austin's north side, a low-income area, hardest hit by the tolls of addiction. We just want to find a way to mentor them and help them see their adults that want to give them a hand up, Snowden said, November 29th of this year. Let's keep scrolling down. A wall outside the Hope to Others Church in Austin, Indiana's north side has over 40 sobriety dates and names written on it celebrating recovery. Keep scrolling down. Hope to Others co-founder Billy Snowden drives the church van to pick up anyone in need of a ride to a Thanksgiving feeding hosted by the Austin Fire Department on November 22nd. Keep scrolling down. Here's that van or that bus that they have. They board the Hope to Others church bus driven by co-founder Billy Snowden in an effort to provide rides to those looking to go to a Thanksgiving feeding hosted by the Austin Fire Department. Let's keep scrolling down. I'll, I'll finish this point. Prayers hang on the wall outside of the Hope to Others church in Austin. You can see where people have put post-its up with prayer requests. Let's keep scrolling. This is what got me right here. Broken. Everyone's broken here. Everyone's pieces mixed up together on the ground. She finds her pieces carelessly smashed under his shoe, and she loses her temper. You could go blind out here in the dark looking for your pieces, not even sure what you look like whole. Dana Snowden, co-founder's wife. Keep, keep going down. Here it is. These kids, they're praying. Children praying at the close of Thursday evening youth programs at Hope to Others Church in Austin's north side. Much of the youth present, typically between ages 5 and 10, prayed for their parents. These are children 
who when picked up, their parents are passed out in their home because of drugs. Some kids that are coming start to bring their parents with them, co-founder Billy Snowden said, we're just trying to end the cycle and create a new one where they can find some hope. Let's keep scrolling down. There's that little sanctuary. That's half of it. That's the left-hand side. There's the carpet we laid. There's the seats we bought. In December of 1998, 20 years ago. And let's scroll down. And here's the kids dancing and ministering. I didn't do all this to try to take you down a stroll down memory lane today. And I'm sorry that looking at those pictures affects me because I put five years of my life there and I didn't want to stay. We should have condemned the building. They should have shut it down. They should have knocked it down. But to know that that building still stands and to know the effort that we put into keeping that building open to keep that church open, now today is ministering to children whose parents are strung out on drugs and some have died. It lets me know that what we go through is for the furtherance of the gospel. See how many times, see that was 20 years ago, do we go through something and we don't understand what the long-lasting impact of what we do it is, it, we don't even understand why it's even existing. Some of you in here that have been here for years, you keep wondering, why did this happen? This family left. This person turned on me. This person did this. And why this hurts so bad, guy? What am I doing, Lord? Why am I doing this? Sometimes you get up and you sing, Lorraine, and you're like, why am I doing this, Lord? I'm going through pain myself. Why am I getting up here? And every single one of us, those of you that stand at the door and you greet, those of you that teach classes, those of you that help out in the nursery, you don't know 20 years from now that baby that you're changing their diapers. You don't know who that's going to end up being. You have no idea. We have no idea the effort that we put forth just when we want to quit. Amen. And the Apostle Paul said, listen, what I'm going through, it is for the furtherance and what the Apostle Paul teaches us here is that all of us have to see ourselves as pioneers. As people who are paving the way for future generations to receive what it is that we're doing. Jake, how many times did you go into a small church with the men and women of action that just had a handful of people? And they didn't have the money to do what they were doing. They didn't have the money to put those repairs into their church. But you came in with a group of guys and women also. And you went in there and gave some hope to that pastor to say, listen, there's people from all over the United States that's willing to come in. We love you. We're here to help you. How many times did you see that happen? And how many times did you make sacrifice and work your job and then go out and Charlotte is traveling with you and both of you dealing with health issues through the years, but you still did it anyway? You guys made those sacrifices because it is for the furtherance of the gospel. How many times, Pastor Adam, did you get into that old bus? Come on, I mean the old bus. You didn't know if it was going to run that week. But you got in that bus anyway. And those cold mornings, if we even had to jump start the battery, we jump started that battery. How many times, church family, hear me. How many times have you done something? How many times have you put forth effort to something and you wonder, where's the fruit? I just want to quit. I'm tired. I'm under attack. I don't feel like doing this anymore. But something on the inside tells you, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. There's something greater than you that's on the inside of you. For the joy that is set before you, you can endure this. My strength is made perfect in your time of weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. Don't look at your present circumstances. Circumstances. Look to the future and understand that if you plant, I'll water and I'll bring the increase. You plant the seed, I'll bring in the harvest. You do what I tell you to do. You say what I tell you to say. You do what I have called you to do and I'm the one and the Lord's got to tell you that. I don't even want to go into the last 18 years here and all the times of everything I've had to go through. That I have woken up in the middle of the night 25 feet from here where my bedroom is in that church parsonage. And I wanted to quit. 
But I have to keep reminding myself. Joy's an inside job. And I got to keep reminding myself. Listen to me. That the depth of our joy is determined by the perspective that we have about our problems. It leads to lesson two, and I'll hurry. Laughter is medicine. I'm ready to laugh for a second. You all want to laugh for a second? (laughs) I know I'm not the only one with this story. I know many of you can have the same testimony. Walt with DOA. Even though we don't have DOA going on, you planted a lot of seed in those six years. He made a difference in a lot of people's lives. There's people here today that was a part of that ministry. And you went through struggles and you had health issues and you were tired, and, but you still came in and you poured into those people's lives. Carrie, how many lives have you impacted with refit? How many times have you been tired and you want to throw in the towel? Laughter's medicine. Let's look at this real quick. Proverbs 17, 22. Laughter does good like a medicine. Well, let's take a laugh break. Let's just pause for a second. Let's get it. Let me gain my composure. Let me read to you a list of church bulletin bloopers <laughs> I came across. <laughs> you ready? This is what it says. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our church and community. (laughs) Instead of in. Tuesday at 4 p.m. there will be an ice cream social. All ladies giving milk will please come early. No, 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 I didn't mean that. Not, not, no. I mean, give milk, but not that. No. Where's you guys' minds at here? They meant pick up a two-gallon milk. Or a gallon of milk, a 2%, excuse me. This being Easter Sunday, we will ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. Maybe she gave milk to the ice cream social, I don't know. Thursday night is our potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. (laughs) Oh boy. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. (laughs) Our scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. Probably four crippled children. The outreach committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any other church. (laughs) Affiliated. Here's a good one, Davida. Evening massage at 6 (laughs) p.m. I think they meant message on that one. The pastor would appreciate if the ladies of the congregation would lend him their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast (laughs) next Sunday morning. Isn't it good to laugh? Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 to 8.30 p.m. Please use the back door. Isn't it good to laugh? This was, this was my goal. I knew the first lesson was going to be heavy. Here's a good one. A song fest was hell at the Methodist Church Wednesday. Some of you didn't get that one. I... The rosebud on the altar this morning is to announce the birth of David Belzer, the sin of Reverend and Mrs. Julius Belzer. <laughs> Some of you just got that, didn't you? 
Let me give you a couple more. We'll move on. This afternoon, there will be a meeting in the south and north ends of the church. Children will be baptized at both ends. <laughs> Ooh, wow, this one's... I didn't write this, so I'm just telling you. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They can be seen in the church basement Saturday. Oh, Michael, I don't think that's what happened when we dropped off those coats and blankets for our coat drive here a couple of weeks ago. You want a couple more? Kind of throw in a couple more here. Here's a good one. Our Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church, but please use the large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> Listen, this is different than any message I preach. This is good sometimes to just kind of sit back and laugh a little. You want another one? Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It is a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. Don't get any ideas here. Okay. Next Sunday is the family hayride and bonfire at the Millars. I filled in your name. Bring your own hot dogs and guns. Friends are welcome. Everybody come for a fun time. <laughs> this morning's sermon, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. <laughs> okay. all right one more i gotta end this announcement in a church bulletin for a national prayer and fasting conference the cost for attending the fasting and prayer conference includes meals <laughs> we need to laugh don't we Listen to these statistics. A child laughs 400 times a day on an average, while an adult laughs only 15 times a day, which is puzzling since laughter feels so good and it's good for us. Why is that? It's because children aren't bogged down with the worries we carry. Children have a different perspective on life than what we have. Listen to this. The benefits of laughter are proven, and I said this, on the mind and on the spirit Norman Cousins used to say that laughter is so beneficial for our body that it's like inner jogging. There was a man that actually healed himself from a chronic disease with what is called laughter therapy. The Mayo Clinic reported that laughter aids breathing by disrupting your normal respira res respiration pattern and increasing your breathing rate. It can even help clear mucus from your lungs. Hearty laughter is also cardioprotective. It's good for your heart. It increases circulation and improves the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tissues that are throughout your, your body. It's a natural stress reliever. Has anybody here laughed so hard that you just deviled over and, and you spit out your food and sometimes released some things? <laughs> laughed so hard. It's proven that people who laugh live longer. Are you getting this? Who wants to live longer? You need to laugh a little. Let's look at this. Let's look at this closing lesson. Look at lesson three. How many of you think Jesus laughed? How many of you think that Jesus taught a lot on joy? When you imagine the life of Jesus, I want you to hear me. I know that he was a suffering savior. I understand that he was a man of many sorrows and the scripture talks about that. But I also believe that Jesus was a man that knew how to laugh. I believe that when he called on the children and the children laughed and the children played with Jesus, I imagine him smiling. 
I imagine when he redeemed somebody and forgave them of their sin and they walked away, I can imagine Jesus with a smile on his face. You got to imagine that, that when Jesus would heal somebody or maybe even, and you read the story when Jesus spit in the mud and would rub it on the eye and the blind man was able to see or the lame man was beginning to walk or, or, or the crippled man began to have his arm and his hand stretch out. Come on, all those examples. You know what I imagine Jesus doing when he would see those miracles, when he would see people healed, when he would see people saved, when he would see people delivered from demonic possession you know what i feel like jesus did at that time he was smiling he was looking at his creation he was understanding i came to seek and to save those that are lost everybody out here are lost and they need a shepherd and i have come as the savior of the world i'm going to take their sins on me i'm going to die for them they don't deserve it but i'm going to give them my love anyway and i've come to manifest the love of the father and to prove to them that i love them and i want them to be my children and i can imagine every time jesus ministered he had a smile on his face now listen, there were times he went into the temple with, a, with, with those cords and knocked over the money changers. I, I get all that. It's funny that Jesus was usually angry when he dealt with the religious crowd, but yet when he dealt with the sinners, he was joyful and he was laughing. Let me give you these scriptures and we'll close. Luke chapter 10 says, Jesus in verse 17, Jesus sent out the 70, two by two, and when they returned... They returned with joy. Jesus sends them out to do ministry and they cast out devils and they come back and the Bible says that they returned with joy. And Mark chapter 4 and in Matthew 13, just jot this down, I didn't give this to you, Susan, but it says that those who bear fruit are those who hear and receive the word with joy. In the book, The Footsteps of Jesus, the author wrote this. Yes, Jesus smiled. Yes, Jesus laughed. Jesus smiled wider and laughed harder than any human being that's ever walked on this planet. He was young. He had good cheer. He was a man of merriment, such gladness of heart, such freedom and openness that he proved to be irresistible for those that wanted to hear his message. He became known throughout Galilee for his genuine strength, the sparkle of his eye, the spring in his step, the heartiness of his laugh, and the genuineness of his touch, his passion, his excitement, his playfulness, his vitality, his joy. He made a dazzling display of love. He set people's hearts on fire. He was an elated, triumphant young man with an incredible quality of life, so different from all of the other religious types that he encountered. Jesus laughed. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 even tells us this. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness in peace. In what? Joy in the Holy Ghost. Oh my goodness. Jesus himself was a man of joy. He had a merry outlook on life. And even when he was being taken and beaten and nailed to the cross. The Bible says that on the inside, for the joy set before him, he endured it all. This is what we need to understand, church family. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says that we got to be filled with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus in John 16, said, Be of good cheer. I know that you're going to face trials, but I have overcome the world. I wonder sometimes whether some of us in church just need a revival of joy. I get it, we need revivals of repentance. I get it, that's needed. I get it that we need revivals of the fire of God. I get that. But I think sometimes we just need a revival of joy. We learn how to laugh again. We learn how to come to church and be joyous about what God's doing in our life and be joyous about our work for the kingdom no matter what we have to go through. Stand with me. Mm -hmm.